Hi, I'm Harold Phillips. And I'm Shannon Myers. And we're the hosts of Working to Live in Southwest Washington, based in Vancouver, Washington. So check out the show and all the shows on the Labor Radio Podcast Network. Hello, working people of Southwest Washington. You're listening to Episode 8 of Working to Live in Southwest Washington, produced by the Southwest Washington Central Labor Council. We're also sponsored by the Vancouver Education Association. Dear friends, welcome to the Labor Radio Podcast Network series, highlighting the work of network members. The growing network of over 70 shows in four countries serves as a one-stop shop for audiences looking for labor content and as a resource for labor broadcasters, podcasters, and content producers. My name is Evan Papp, and I produce Empathy Media Lab's podcast on labor, political economy, arts, and culture. And we're a proud member of the Labor Radio Podcast Network. Shannon, could you tell me a little bit about yourself, where you grew up, and what led you to organize labor? Well, I grew up Shannon McCormick, and I actually grew up in Southern Oregon, Medford, Oregon. Went to town school in Phoenix and Talent, Oregon, and I'd just like to give a shout out to my hometowns that just went through a whole bunch of wildfires and actually lost a lot of homes. But anyway, I grew up in Southern Oregon. My dad was a union guy. He was a communication worker. He was the phone guy that came in and actually put together your home line back then when we had landlines. And we went to union picnics every summer. And I just loved the union and the family. But I did go to school. I went to college and got my uh, degree in marketing and economics. And after working in the private sector, they say, for a while, and my first job, I got laid off. Or actually, I did get fired. I'll just admit, I did get fired. But that was because I had just gotten married, and I told them that I may be looking for work in another city to be with my husband. So they just decided to fire me and give my job to the person that I was training. Training. Seriously? He, yeah. I actually trained him so I could go on my honeymoon and they fired me three weeks after I got back. Talk about no protection. Mm -hmm. Then I came up to Portland area. I live in Vancouver, Washington now, and I found a job in a local uh, mail house, which is a type of marketing. It's all of that glorious mail we get in there telling us to vote for somebody or buy this. That's marketing. And I worked in two places. The first one, actually, uh, they started siphoning our money from the company and our health insurance to pay bills because they weren't uh, doing good in business. And uh, I actually looked for another job when I saw that people were walking through the warehouse looking to purchase our equipment that we use on a daily basis. And the day that I told them I was leaving, they put chains on the doors and everybody was out of a job. And then the next place I went to work, I, I actually put together a in internal company uh, web page so that we could all figure out what people are doing and if somebody was missing then somebody could pick up that piece of the job it's called you know inter training of you know employees well guess what <laughs> they fired me because they told me that now the secretary could do my job and they didn't need a professional marketing person so wow uh, That's how I came to the labor movement, because my next job was union. I took it over. I've been very successful. Now I'm president of the Labor Council, and I am fighting for working people every single day. And that love is it. the Southwest Washington Central Labor Council. Love it. Love it. Harold, over to you. Talk a little bit about yourself, where you grew up, and what led you to organize labor. Yeah. Where I grew up is a very complicated question because I'm an army brat. So I lived in, I think, seven different places growing up before I actually stayed in one place and my family moved on to their next posting. I think it was when I was in Germany that I saw my first live play, ironically, in London, in Regent's Park. And... I kind of thought this might be a thing that I would want to do for a living. 
And so acting became sort of my through line as we moved from town to town. Fast forward to high school in Anchorage, Alaska. That was kind of my sole focus. So when my family moved on to their next posting, I stayed at the University of Alaska for a few years. And then I realized, oh, maybe Anchorage, Alaska isn't the best place to be a professional actor. So I came down to what we like to call the lower 48 with the goal of going to Los Angeles. And I met a woman from Portland. This is a very common Portland story. Ended up moving to Portland. I've been in this area for about 25 years now. And we recently moved up across the river from Portland to Vancouver, Washington, where I got involved with the Southwest Washington Central Labor Council. As to how I was drawn to the labor movement, that's kind of an interesting story too, because I didn't think I grew up in a union household. My dad was in the military during the 80s. So he was definitely a fan of Ronald Reagan, but he was also a fan of working people. And every time we'd go on trips, he'd have conversations with truck drivers and people who worked on the roads and people doing different jobs, talking to them about what their workplace was like and what their lives were like. When I actually joined my union, SAG-AFTRA, the union for performers and broadcasters and voiceover artists, he mentioned that his father, my grandfather, actually helped to start an operating engineer's union in Arizona. So come to find out, I did come from a union household and I didn't know anything about it. Now, as an actor, we don't have a lot of workplace protections in the non-union world. We have a lot of people who are scrambling to get any job and they're often put in harm's way. They're often not paid on time or ever for their work. They can be treated pretty poorly. I came to the labor movement because I started talking to union actors and I started seeing what things were like on the union side of the street. And then I started booking union work and I started to see the difference between union sets and non-union sets. So when I became eligible to join SAG-AFTRA, I said, sign me up. And here we are. And here we are. So, a lot of people may not be interested in labor news or even understand why unions and organized labor are, is a very important function in our country. I'm gonna just kind of open this up and if you wanna give your thoughts about why people should be interested in, in labor news. Well, I'll take a stab at this because being a vice president for the Washington State Labor Council as well, I represent, you know, the 600,000 plus workers throughout Washington State. And people need to know the big part about representation. It's also about safety. And right now, safety is a key issue for everybody. We're getting calls at the Labor Council from people who are coming to us asking if there's any regulations on how they should go back to work. I'll give an example, dental hygienists, they're not usually unionized. They're a lot of times independent contractors and they're now being forced to go back to work with no safety regulations. And so they're concerned and they're quitting their jobs and leaving their employment. And the unions are out there fighting not only for our members, but for all members in safety respects. I know that union leaders here in Washington state were actually on our governor, uh, Governor Inslee's reopening committee or task force to determine how it is safe to go back to work in different industries and so the unions are out there right now for people's safety and right now we are all concerned about our safety for ourselves and our families and if people are not feeling safe they're not going to work and if people aren't going to work then our com communities are going to fall apart so if anybody feels unsafe at work and they feel like they're alone they're not 
they have an opportunity to come and belong to a union. We are inclusive. We want to help everybody. We want to lift everybody up. And that's why I think it's important that our message gets out there now more than ever. And I think I would dispute the whole framing of the question in some ways, Evan. I think that more people are interested in labor news than people might think. And I think more listeners are interested in labor news than they even know. What I mean by that is more and more, even before the pandemic, working people in the United States have started to realize that they're not being treated fairly in the workplace. And we saw this going back to the early parts of the 2000s. In fact, I remember having a conversation with a SAG-AFTRA exec saying that when the book is written about the 21st century, one of the first chapters will be the resurgence of organized labor because we were already starting to see this in 2005, 2006. People who weren't traditional union members were starting to come together and talk about their workplace treatment and talk about how safe they were and talk about how unbalanced the economy was. And they were going out in the streets. That's one of the reasons why the AFL-CIO started Working America is because there were a lot of non-union workers who were going out and organizing outside of the labor movement. What we've seen over the past couple of years with the pandemic and with attacks on workplace rights is a lot of these people who were honestly afraid of the word union. I mean, I grew up in the 80s. I can tell you, it's been drummed into us that unions are bad. They're starting to realize this feeling they've had for a long time that something isn't right and they should do something about it can be helped by the labor movement that's already there. And so they're reaching out to a lot of unions. They're reaching out to the labor councils asking for help in their workplaces. So more and more, your average working people want to hear stories about what it's like at work and how things can be better at work, and the labor movement is there for them. That's one of the reasons why we started our podcast. That's a perfect segue to discuss how you came up with Working to Live in Southwest Washington, why you want to start the show, what it's about, and where people can find it. Well, you'll note that the show isn't unions in Southwest Washington. Shannon and I actually talked a lot about what the best title for our podcast would be because we want this show to appeal to all working people in our region and across the world because, of course, it's on the internet and anybody can listen to it from anywhere. So up here in the Pacific Northwest, we have a saying, we don't live to work we work to live. And we figured that was probably a good intro for working people, whether they're in the union or not, to hear stories about workplace issues. And along the way, if they realize that these are union members telling these stories and that there are ways that they can make things better, that's not a bad thing either, right, Shannon? Absolutely not. And the whole reason that we started this show was because we have a big election coming up in 2020. And we needed to increase our communication, not only to our members, but to our community as a whole. Because we're all stuck in our houses, and I shouldn't say stuck. We are all respectfully staying in our homes to keep our communities safe. So we had to come up with different ways to talk to people. And of of course, Harold, being the SAG-AFTRA brother that he is, he's like, hey, let's do a podcast. And I'm like, ooh, that sounds like fun. So, of course, I was on board. Then we just had to, you know, go back to our executive board and budget for it and all of those things that we do as an organization because, you know, we have to get approval from our board and our delegates. And so they said, of course, Harold, doing a podcast would be great. So... What we decided was that we have some amazing candidates in our local area that we need to get the word out. So we decided to do this podcast weekly, and every week we are highlighting a new political endorsed candidate from labor. But 
you know, not everybody is a political geek like me or Harold. So we had to include some fun stuff. So then we started thinking about, well, why don't we start highlighting workers in Southwest Washington, which are our union members, our delegates. So we started coming up with shows and we had a show about essential employees in Southwest Washington. We had a show about apprenticeship programs because God forbid, not everybody's set up for college. So you got to make a living. We're giving them options. And then we also have shows about local can races that we have for Clark County Charter. So, you know, we wanted to make it fun, but we also wanted to educate people because the elections that happen on a local level impact our lives even more than the national level. And we're trying to make sure our community knows where the labor movement stands. Well, and I'd just like to add that Shannon gives me a lot of credit for this. And I did bring it to the Labor Council, but it's largely because as a sag after a member, I have a certain set of skills. And one of those skills is talking for a living, right? I think a lot of labor communications are still stuck in written form. They think in terms of newsletters. They think in terms of flyers. And those work in some situations. If you have a break room where you can stick a flyer up on a cork board, but the reality is, in the 21st century, a lot of us were decentralized even before the pandemic. We don't have a centralized break room or a water cooler where we can gather and talk about these things. So the thought is that if we provide a different venue to get this message out, we're going to hit a different audience. And I think that's what we're seeing when we're looking at the numbers. The people who might look at email or Facebook may listen to the podcast. But a lot of the podcast listeners may not look at their email or their Facebook or other more traditional communications methods. So we wanted to have a different quiver in our quarrel to get that word out to working people in our region. Harold, this is directed at you. As a founding member of the Labor Radio Podcast Network, can you talk a little bit about how it got started and talk a little bit about the network that you've spent so much time on over the last six months. I think there's a hunger in working people throughout the country to hear stories about workplace issues. And I definitely had a hunger for that myself. When I go out and mow the lawn or clean out my gutters, I would plug in the podcasts and I'd search around for something that I found interesting. And what I found was that it was really hard to find labor content in the podcast sphere. If you looked up labor on Stitcher, which is my preferred podcast platform, you'd get podcasts about pregnancy. And if you looked up union, you get a lot of podcasts about soccer teams in the UK. So those shows were out there, but there really wasn't a way to find them easily. And then quite by accident, I found out about Chris Garlock in the Metro DC Labor Council. I think it's Metro Council AFL-CIO. And he had this list of labor radio shows and podcasts around the country. So this was pretty exciting and I reached out to him. At this point, I was still kind of formulating the idea for working to live in Southwest Washington. I hadn't even brought it to Shannon and the Labor Council yet. And we got to talking about how we could expand and formalize things. Then the pandemic hit, and strangely enough, I had a lot of time on my hands. So we started to build out some infrastructure. We built out a website. We made the list a little more refined, and we started adding members, added the social media components. And uh, you can find our social media by searching hashtag labor radio pod on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter. And once we brought that to the world, we started to see that there actually is a lot of interest as people started sharing these shows and started retweeting, reposting. So that's kind of it in a nutshell. I wanted to find more labor shows to listen to, and now we've found over 70, including our own show. 
I'm so glad that you're selfish and wanted to listen to labor because now we can all benefit from it. Thank you, Harold. Thank you, Harold. So my final question is uh, looking into the future of organized labor, where do you see opportunity and hope? And I'm going to start with you, Shannon. Great, because I was gonna start anyway. I am so hopeful for organized labor and I'll tell you why. Because workers are tired of not having a work-life balance anymore. They are tired of stating that they have to be on call 24 seven for their job or their employer. I know that people were seeing this before as Harold said, but they are really seeing it now that we are all at home working and having family and people I know I realized that I was missing a lot and what is our time in our life really worth and you know when my employer tried to take away my vacation I told him pretty much to stick it because work-life balance is more important to me than a paycheck and I'm very grateful that I can make that decision but I know that people are going to start standing up. They want health care. They want work-life balance. They want a safe working condition. And they want respect. You know, your work is part of who we are. And we should be respected for that. And when I talk to youngins like my kids who are a junior in high school and a freshman in high school, you know, they're not going to put up with this shit. They really aren't they want a good job they they've gone to more union rallies and stood up for workers than most you know rank and file members and it's not just them it's their friends their friends want a good job they want a house they don't see that right now rent is so crazy wages are stagnant people are not going to be able to live and it is really coming out now and i think that the labor movement i mean hey we're here everybody we are here, we can join together, and we can fight for our work-life balance. And that's why I think that organized labor is going to do nothing but start representing hundreds of thousands of new members over the next year or two, for sure. Harold, please to take us home here. I, I couldn't agree with Shannon more. I'm going to say it again. When the book is written about the 21st century, a major chapter in the Erling part is going to be titled The Resurgence of Organized Labor. And part of that is because people are fed up. The economy has been unbalanced for so long and working people have been taking it and taking it and taking it. And there's just nothing more to give. Part of it, though, is this generation that's coming up. And I think this is something that we in the labor movement really have to accommodate and we really have to pave the road for our next generation of leaders because the leaders in their 20s and 30s who are coming up right now are on fire and they have a way of thinking that is going to carry this movement into the next century. Old fogies like us who grew up in the 70s, 80s. Hey! Speak uh, for yourself, Harold. Yeah, I know. You're only 25. I'm 25. We don't discuss age. We, we have a hard time thinking in terms of small groups and in social media circles and in sort of cell mentality, for want of a better term. Millennials, Gen Z, Gen Y, whatever the heck we're calling the kids who are six, seven, eight now, they've grown up with that thought process. And that's what organized labor is all about, is bringing people together and working together for a common goal. That's the way these kids have been raised. And so we need to be able to unleash them so that they can shape this movement for the generations that are coming out later. And I feel really confident that they are going to be the leaders that we need to move things into the future. Now, it'll be bumpy along the way, <laughs> inevitably, 
but we've already got some really strong leaders in their 20s like Cooper Carraway out in South Dakota with great ideas and the ability to marshal people to their cause and direct them and activate them. And I expect to see a lot more of that moving forward. And they better do well because my retirement depends on it. Heck yeah. <laughs> For the future. Shannon yes. Myers, Harold Phillips, Working to Live Southwest Washington. You can check out their show and all the shows on the Labor Radio Podcast Network. Thank you so much for your time.